we can start. Unfortunately, uh, Professor Subotic um, um, faced some problems with, with connection, so I, I will try to replace her in, in uh, uh, this session and uh, uh, we'll take over the, the moderation of, of uh, the, the, the whole panel. Uh, well, well, we have uh, six or five uh, speakers uh, on this panel. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure is Virag uh, Buka with us today, uh, but uh, uh, we will start with uh, with uh, Vida's presentation, and uh, I will uh, just briefly read uh, her uh, uh, bio. Vida is an art historian, curator, cultural worker member of the Context Collective, whose work is based on a process of connecting critical and theory in practice, the field of arts and culture with wider social and political um, effects. From 2006 to 2010, uh, she was working on the Context Collective uh, Context Gallery project, from 2008 to 2010, she, uh, she was teaching at the Advanced Vocational Studies School of Fine Arts and Applied Arts in Belgrade. In 2008, she completed her uh, uh, master studies at the Department of Art and Media Theory at the University of Arts in Belgrade. And in 2018, she completed 19, uh, pardon, she completed uh, her PhD thesis entitled Theory and Practice of Critical Left in Yugoslav Culture, Yugoslav Art Between the uh, Two war, uh, World Wars and the revolu Revolutionary Social Movements. Since 2014 on, uh, she has uh, uh, been one of the editors of the educational project and the left online magazine Machina.versa, uh, where uh, she deals with uh, the relationship between cultural and art media pro uh, production, economy, politics, and activism. Vida, if you are ready, you can start share screening. Yeah, I, uh, hello to everybody. I will just share screen. Um, can you see this? Yes, 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 it's okay. Uh, so uh, in my presentation, I will speak about the historical example of political organizing of artists, uh, about the case study of Yugoslav illegal group Život or Life, trying to reflect upon these events uh, through the contemporary perspective of the art institutions that have, uh, let's say, the same or similar institutional roots. Uh, but before I continue with the historical part of my research, uh, I would like to give few remarks about the contemporary situation in Belgrade art scene concerning the struggle of artists for better working and living conditions. Uh, new cultural laws in Serbia that were introduced during the past uh, 20 uh, years have made the status of independent or a freelance artist almost unbearable. Namely, uh, according to new law changes, uh, the state of Serbia put them in the category of entrepreneurs, which is in conflict with the legal formulation of independent artists. That means uh, that all working and social rights, for example, health insurance, pension, etc., that artists gained during the Yugoslav socialist state when they were legally categorized as part of the employed working people, were canceled. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that almost uh, 2,500 people uh, registered as independent artists in Serbia today uh, through one of the 34 registered representative, uh, representative art associations are rather surviving. They were brought to the brink of collapse or more precisely into debt bondage. Although this problem was present uh, for many years, it seems that nobody cared for that till last year. So what happened uh, in one of the majority, uh, in one of the major representative art association, Association of Fine Art Artists of Serbia, which became through the decades a very conservative and retrograde art institution, but still it was in charge for the artist's legal rights, 
a group of progressive artists succeeded in uniting and took over the association. They formed new committees that introduced new policies grounded in the horizontal and democratic politics, or one could say in self-management or self-governance policies or politics that could be traced in their transparent new management initiatives to work on the improvement of their social and working conditions, fair, fair pay practices, new exhibitions and curatorial practices, and etc. This is still a very new event, uh, and the question is what will be developed out of this initiative. But it can be said that this unique artistic initiative for so long is showing a tendency for political organizing of artists in order to improve their labor rights, addressing the question of artwork as work, as labor, and thinking about arts uh, em emancipatory social function. Uh, during the past uh, weeks, we have witnessed a continu continuity of attacks coming from the political and cultural right on artists in Serbia provoked not exclusively, exclusively uh, but by artwork, but also by the artists' efforts to break the deadlock of problems concerning their social and labor status. This is, ve this is very actual thing going on in Serbia. Uh, so what if we juxtapose these two struggles, uh, the different historical but also political moments connected by the same material space in which the struggles, or at least part of the struggles, took place. As a matter of fact, the epicenter of contemporary artist struggle was exactly there, in the same space where it was 80, year, 80 years ago, in and around the Tsvieta Zuzuric Art Pavilion, which is still managed by the Association of Fine Artists of Serbia. Svjeta Zuzuric Art Pavilion in Belgrade was a very important place for the art scene back then. It was important for the socially engaged art group Life and other progressive artists connected to group Life. Now I'm talking about the period, interwar period. It was the only art pavilion serving as the gallery space, but also as a city cultural institution built a decade earlier for the purpose. This was part of my doctoral thesis. Uh, I was researching a lot about the historical events, social conditions, art group. But here for this occasion, I will put some, uh, some aspects and thesis in front of you that I consider the most interesting for our topic today. Uh, the art group Život was established in the interwar period precisely during the year 1934 as illegal art group directly connected to illegal Communist Party of Yugoslavia. Since the members of the group and their associates were close to Communist Party of Yugoslavia, they, they also had to function illegally. They were never publicly known under that name, nor was the name of the group mentioned in any newspaper. According to the, according to the Communist Party policy introduced in that time, around 1934-35, politics of people front uh, that, that says that parties should take all legal means, taking over legal bourgeois organizations, and institutions as much as they could. Group life also took part in the legal official art scene. But as I said, without mentioning the real name of the group, they were called in the public or by the art journals as critiques, as realists or progressives, or somewhere boycotters in rela relation to their public or legal activities. While they were illegally working uh, what was necessary for for Communist Party, legally they were organizing various group exhibitions, art events, taking part in the Belgrade art scene, etc., with the aim at bringing together as wide as possible a progressive front of artists and intellectuals, regardless of the differences in individual styles, art language, and methodology. Uh, while they were illegally work, uh, illegal group, sorry, uh, illegal 
illegal group life emerged in the time of state uh, of repression and censorship in the kingdom of Yugoslavia, back then as a het heterogeneous artistic group of plural pluralistic views on artistic styles and directions, organized around two key ideas. Art as a social practice, and the second one, art that critically considers the relationship of content of the artwork, its form, and the question of art production and its organizational change. Uh, such an artistic practice, which in the sphere of art advocated class, class struggle by artistic and political means, is a practice defined by, by Walter Benjamin through a clear distinction between question about the position of work of art in the production relations of its epoch, but also bring the question of the sub subjectivization of intellectuals in the political struggle. In the case of uh, group Život and the left art front that they initiated and organized, it was precisely such transversal changing of chaining of artistic and political struggles. So uh, when I was uh, talking at the beginning about uh, the social benefits that contemporary artists had, but were suspended to the neoliberal law changes, all those benefits were the product of these revolutionary struggles began during the interwar period, culminating during the Second World War and anti-fascist and communist struggle, succeeding in producing socialist state of Yugoslavia after the war. So already after the war, various working and living conditions for artists were improved, alongside with the many working and social benefits brought by the socialist state of Yugoslavia for all the people. So if we consider the artistic and political practice of group Život as inherent to the Yugoslav revolution, and if we define the Yugoslav revolution that already started in this period as contingent, intersectional, transnational, avant-garde, communist, and feminist, anti-fascist breakthrough, which through the policy of continuity, unity, and organic connection, led to the transformation of ways of production and social relations, both artistic and political. It gives us the completely other dimension of the group practice than the one how it was already historicized. So uh, during uh, the year 1932, artist Mirko Kujacic, Later, he will initiate the idea about the group and uh, became one of its main protagonists, published his influential manifesto, and then organized a solo exhibition at the art pavilion Cvjeta Zuzorić as a performative act. He exhibited his two canvases in a manner of ready-made or informal, painting with a boot, and painting with an, with an onion and read his manifesto in which he renounces his previous bourgeois art and gives a draft of a new art he wants to fight for. He addressed harsh economical conditions, social injustice, precarious position of artists in the kingdom society. And it was turning point that radically influenced some artists already affiliated with the addressed problem. His manifesto, which was structural, structurally set in the spirit of zenitistic metric, represented one of the most fundamental articulation of the problem of artistic work in capitalist artistic system, although set in fragmentary and manifest form. Such a materialistic articulation of the problem of artistic work in the, in the system 
as well as position of the artist as a hired worker is one of the most thorough artistic analysis in the period in question. The establishment of the art market and the relative commodification of artwork were a reality much earlier and followed the development of the concept of art autonomy, art pluralism and formalism that were under attack already during the previous decade by local avant-garde movement, Zenitism and Surrealism. So basically they were saying that the political task of art is to free the work of art from the subsumption under capital and to emancipate itself from the dictates of its reproduction. In conducted research, uh, the emphasis was placed on three parallel directions of activities of the illegal group life, which were sim simultaneously intervened and intersected. To conscious decision to change the means of production by taking over the media of graphics as one that enables accessibility and mass reproduction, which could lead to the politicization of artistic practice by artistic means. Second, on struggle for better material and working conditions of artists in a particular socioeconomic system. Third, on important contribution to the broad revolutionary movement led by Communist Party of Yugoslavia, leading the people's liberation struggle, the final victory over fascism and the creation of a new socialist society. Uh, just in few words, although this is uh, uh, although this is very important part of the research, the role of uh, women artists that were closely uh, connected and col uh, collaborating with the group life. Majority of them were part of the revolutionary youth section of women movement, taking part in various activities, both legal and, leg and illegal. They were taking part in producing very important and famous magazine called Woman Today. They were designed it, illustrating in writing articles, taking part in political education of women working, workers, folk women, housewives, initiating political field work, going into the city periphery, educating women in health issues, teaching them some basic courses such as sewing and typography. At the same time, they were illegally working as party members, organizing party cells, bringing important party messages, connecting with unions, etc. Uh, through this case study of group uh, Život, it is very interesting to examine the relationship between art and politics through the correlation between specific artistic practices of Yugoslav critical art and the collective social body of the then revolutionary movement, which was built through intersectional, intertextual and transnational cooperation of workers, women's and youth students movement. This group uh, set up a series of independent exhibitions called Salon of Independent in other often improvised exhibition spaces connecting uh, through the exhibition work their political work with their artwork. Artists organized with broader political organizing is they were part of the organized revolutionary movement, all the sections of the movement interconnected additionally. Students were organizing additional discursive and educational program. Unions were inviting workers to visit the exhibition where they could find various information, conspiracy plans, propaganda material, calling for supporting revolutionary fight in the Spanish war, anti-fascist material, organized help for the most vulnerable people, but also producing illegal documents necessary for the member of Forbidden Communist Party. Uh, 
In such a complex view of art society politics, one can understand many contradictions that surround the artistic practices accompanying artistic political events that culminated in the formation of a collective artistic body, the Left Art Front. In such defined social relations revolution, as well as the art that accompanies it, means setting new coordinates of the possible in confrontation with the impossible. The question of possibility of politization of art, or if you uh, like democratization of art practices in relation to the existence of progressive political movements in a specific historical moment is very important here. These historical facts must also be taken into account when we talk about contemporary attempts to politicize artists and their art practices. In the contemporary situation in the global, but also local art system, the absence of a strong political actor, party, movement, trade union, etc., is evident for decades on. So in majority cases, artistic treatments of political issues are left without a horizon of a real political actor, which could lead systematic change in social relations. That means also the change in art system, art institutions, art production and reproduction, etc. What is now happening in and around the Association of Fine Artists and Svieta Zuzorić Pavilion is still a very new event. And the question is what will be developed out of this initiative. But it can be said that this, at the moment, unique artistic institution is showing a tendency for political organizing of artists in order to improve their labor rights. What we can learn from the historical events is that the struggle of artists for better working and living conditions is possible only if it is connected to broader social struggle. The struggle of artists in the interwar period was just a part of the broader revolutionary movement in Yugoslavia that organically connected all other struggles, workers, revolutionary youth and students, women's struggle. For now, contemporary artists' struggle is solitary battle. Unfortunately, yet, there is no broad progressive struggle that artists could be related to. Still, something changed during this COVID situation. Some lessons have been learned in this crisis, such as the one about the necessity to be organized, united and solid solidary. An example of this are the organizations on, on the local, independent cultural and artistic scene united with the professional art associations, such as Association of Fine Artists in Serbia, which initiated and organized the Solid Solidary Fund for, for cultural workers of Serbia, for art artists and cultural workers in need, and constantly put pressure on the authorities and the public. Only after the pressure was exerted, certain rights were won. They all stood behind the request, culture for all, decent work for all. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will stop here and uh, in the discussion we can continue with, with uh, uh, some thesis that I put here. Okay. Thank you. And Thank you, Vita. Uh, we will continue with uh, Martin Sarvas. Um, Martin uh, holds a, a Bachelor in Design and Art Theory from the uh, Mokoli Nagi University of Art and Design in Budapest and a Master Degree in socio so Sociology and Social Anthropology from Central European University also in uh, Budapest. His PhD dissertation entitled uh, Peace Time for Soldiers of Culture, Civic, uh, Civil uh, Cultivation uh, in Hungary's Houses of Culture since 1990s, uh, interrogates with uh, uh, the changing relationship between state and culture in contemporary Hungary. It examines how uh, have governmental modes of cultural production transformed uh, in the post-socialist uh, era 
what are the challenges met by cultural policies and institutions how have uh, citizens actively voiced participation and or a resistance to political and social changes it uh, examines how com complex processes uh, through which actors both professionals of culture and citizens create reproduce but also context the sim uh, symbolic power of the state um, state in and uh, through the in institutions of the house of culture here is the member he is the member of a uh, uh, working group of public so sociology um, Helizet, uh, I, I'm not sure about pronunciation, uh, which uh, aims to uh, produce and uh, disseminate alternative social knowledge for uh, the sake of social change and a founding member of the Solidarity Economy Center in uh, Budapest. Uh, Martin, whenever you're ready, you can start sharing your screen. I will unmute you, just a moment. Yeah. I think now it's okay. Yes, we can hear you. And see? So, I will be speaking about uh, uh, one specific case uh, from my thesis. Uh, it's a worker hostel experiment uh, from the 70s in Budapest uh, and uh, it's related to this generally this uh, state uh, organized civic cultivation which uh, I call I mean it's a Hungarian word and I'm sure that in many Eastern European countries it's it's a well-known <laughs> practice as uh, it is organized mainly houses of culture or community centers, uh, which I know that in Serbia or in Romania uh, is a similar is a similar in institutions in Hungary, and I call civic cultivation a practice which includes dissemination of knowledge and culture cultural practices, community building, and uh, it's also uh, a way of commodification or the commodification of local cultural traditions. And it's, uh, it's an assemblage of different educational activities uh, uh, which basically on culture or but also related to uh, economic practices or entrepreneurial practices uh, generally. Uh, and this thesis is based on two field work I did in two Hungarian rural towns. One is Shagotarian, which is an industrial town in eastern northern Hungary, and Mezekves, which is like a rural uh, rural town based on agricultural production where the local peasant culture is kind of considered uh, important from the narrative of the Hungarian state formation. And civic cultivation generally as a, as a pra state practice is considered to be important uh, uh, from the 19th century on as a part of making of the nation state and making of a coherent narrative on the, on the, cu on the culture of the nation. Uh, but back then, in this early period of the institutionalization of it, it's, uh, it's more a voluntary uh, activity where the state itself doesn't organize it uh, centrally but different groups of uh, associations and, and uh, culture groups and local uh, actors organize these different groups and then ask for funding from the state who then establish these houses of culture or community centers and obviously after uh, 1949 and uh, in this Stalinist uh, period of, uh, of of Hungarian socialism uh, it becomes kind of the means of uh, of the making of the of the of the culture of the worker state and, and an asset of, of that top-down ideological education and because of many changes in cultural policy from the 70s on, uh, 
uh, it becomes more as a as a means of economic development and also culture is more and more imagined as uh, as something which can contribute to the to the economic development of the socialist state so uh, through and i will be speaking about that mostly enhancing the quality of the workforce through different practices and educational activities uh, and the context of this uh, worker hostel experiment is the is the new economic mechanism which was introduced in 1968 in Hungary, which was kind of a, a economic uh, reform process which tried to uh, introduce profitability indicate, indi indicators uh, among the industries, also supporting the competition amongst them. And uh, that meant also that uh, that it uh, kind of supported uh, competition between different uh, firms and industries. And in that context, uh, as I formerly mentioned, culture was more and more imagined not as a kind of a, something which uh, creates social uh, coherence or something which uh, which is kind of a backbone of, uh, of the socialist uh, state, but more as a, as a means of economic development. And parallel to that process, <coughs> uh, this, and there an institution which was organizing uh, these educational programs all around the country. It's called the Institute of Civil Cultivation, which was established also in 1940. Uh, nine, and uh, that institution became more and more autonomous to 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 create and uh, implement programs related to uh, uh, civic cultivation. And uh, this small case which, uh, which I'm focusing on, called the uh, worker host hostel experiment in. In 1971, this institution of civil cultivation got funding from 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 the Ministry of Culture to 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 develop a program which deals with uh, with uh, worker hostels or workers who are uh, migrating to urban uh, centers because the problem was that. Uh, that this rural workforce was kind of unstable and uh, and they didn't stay in the in these urban centers only for two three years and uh, for the sustainability of these newly established uh, productive capacities uh, they needed a more stable reliable workforce and part of this uh, program was that uh, researchers of this institution, the Institute for Civic Cultivation, went to these worker hostels and uh, made an ethnographic research on <coughs> as the social biography of the workers. So where they are coming from, what are the actual practices they have in, in that uh, city, and uh, how they cope with this uh, uh, displacement or was or the changing context in an urban uh, center. And based on those researches, they uh, formed different groups. Uh, and, and based on these focus group discussions, they started to develop programs which uh, try to process that kind of change which they experienced as a part of migration from, from a rural to an urban context. And it many it, it involved many of uh, uh, like artistic means like uh, they did photographic uh, photography on the on the everyday uh, living conditions of themselves and then they had a discussion on how uh, on what changed and how they uh, compared that to the the original living uh, environment or it also involved like uh, literature so they read novels 
and based on those novels they try to make discussions on the on that everyday experience and uh, so it basically what they did i mean these researchers and educators of the civic cultivation of the institute for civic cultivation that uh, they tried to utilize these kinds of cultural products for for creating a space in this uh, uh, unfamiliar environment of the workers so i use uh, this uh, term labor, labor special fix that not only labor capital is basically capable to, to transform and produce landscapes, but also the, in, in interaction with it, uh, labor alike is participating in the co-production of spaces. So like basically these kinds of uh, brokers of culture or educators were uh, helping or like uh, helping to to, to produce that kind of uh, space. Uh, but it also meant that uh, they try to process this so shock of mobility in the terms of only <coughs> spatial mobility because that didn't mean any, uh, while there was a rural urban migration, it didn't mean that, uh, that it, it, it is a massive social mobility for these workers. And through that, also mapping and creating these familiarities in the new environment, they try to fix, uh, try to make uh, these uh, new laborers uh, stay in, in this new context. And it was very short lived. So, like, uh, it lasted only two years. Uh, and it was kind of like a last uh, big interventionist uh, uh, endeavor of this uh, the Institute of Civic Cultivation in many terms. Uh, but because after that, mostly they started to focus on uh, on creating uh, on ed educational practices through telecommunication devices like uh, television. Uh, but uh, but as a as a as a practice as a practice it was uh, later in like in micro management of of the workforce than part of the education of these uh, educators uh, so why i think it's kind of an important uh, case to look at uh, because it's like there is like this institutional system which uh, which is present in many of the eastern european and post socialist contexts which in the while uh, kind of supporting community based culture production also selectively uh, incorporates these pra culture practices into state practices but in the meantime, also, uh, also through its own means, uh, transforms these local practices. So it's kind of this discrepancy that, in the in the, also in the mind of of these educators or in the people who are engaged with civic cultivation, that uh, while they support local community culture production, they also uh, participate in the making of, of, of the dom actually the effective dominant culture. And uh, if we look at this practice, it, it is this discrepancy that, uh, that why there is a control of the workforce uh, through culture. In the meantime, there is also like the creation of, of a local place or the place of the workforce through culture. Uh, and there is like this, uh, especially in the situation now, like uh, in, in the hegemony of our populist uh, conservative government, there is like the rediscovery of this infrastructure as it is capable to, to, 
to speak to a multiple of multi of to many people because it's the only institutional system which is kind of present in rural centers and rural contexts apart from like Budapest and and uh, uh, official institutions of of uh, culture production and uh, there is like this uh, processing of how that infrastructure which is originally was made for the maintenance and and production of uh, of state power is capable to be transformed into something else which serves local community cultural production. And that's the presentation. I think that's 50 minutes. Okay, thank you, Martin, for this very interesting case presentation. I'm, I'm very interested to to read uh, uh, more about this ongoing research, hopefully in paper after the, the, the conference. Um, I will now announce our next uh, panelist, um, Vito Vojnic Puzar. Puzar yeah. um, Vito was born in, in uh, Subotica uh, in Yugoslavia. Uh, after initial education in electrotechnical and information technology and spending some time working years in this field, a slow but uh, decisive shift uh, happened towards uh, contemporary art. He graduated from the Hungarian University of Fine Arts uh, and uh, 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 he did his master studies uh, and as uh, followed as uh, expert in contemporary art theory and uh, curatorial studies uh, at the same university. Coaching uh, visual art, uh, visual artists, uh, curating exhibitions, searching for intersection intersection points between art, technology, and society in a broader broader con uh, context. Uh, in the tradition uh, tradition of socially engaged art, are some of the uh, are some of his fields of interest and activities. Currently, he is researching new artistic tools based on recent technological developments, and he's active as a curator and art uh, uh, critic. So, Vito, if you're ready, you can start. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, it, it's okay now. We can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to take a part in this uh, conference. And uh, I will try only to give you a, a small insight on, on uh, one German artist uh, called Christoph Schlingensiv. Whose, whose artistic practice was actually very, very much related to imagining a new, another type of art world and also other type of society. So in the first um, two uh, slides, unfortunately, I will just read you the, the text because uh, in just a second. Uh, Yes, as, as you can also read, uh, Christoph Maria Schlingensi was born in 1960 in Oberhausen, industrial city in Federal Republic of Germany. His father was a pharmacist and his mother a pediatric nurse. This is a repeated uh, running gag of his magical biography of Christoph Schlingensi. It is very important also uh, to mention that his father was also a member of the Alliance Club, a very special club where um, Alliance Club invited also Josef Beuys to Oberhausen. So Christoph Schlingensi as a child could see Josef Beuys in action. So he grew up in a middle-class Catholic world, a child between the times Oh, I, unfortunately, I cannot see it now because I need uh, maybe like this. Yes, thank you. A um, uh, time when the heroic re revolt of the 1968, which had to unintentionally tip into the comic, was repeated in the revolt of the comic provocations, which unintentionally turns into heroism. 
This is resembling Karl Marx's quote, history repeats itself first as tragedy, second as farce. This is an uh, important point about uh, Christoph Schlingel's If Life, because in his um, artistic actions, he in many times was referring to the 1968 revolution. He was not stating he was considering this as a failed revolution, but he was provocating and playing around with this idea. idea. Partial because of his petit bourgeois family background and strong Catholic upholding, uh, like served as an altar server 16 years in a local church, he became sensitive to the social political climate of after the Federal Republic of Germany. One of his most notable films regarding German unification or division is the German Change So Massacre, the first hour of the reunification, in which movie he was uh, uh, showing some East Germans uh, traveling to West Germany where the West German cousins would meet them and then actually realizing uh, as a kind of cannibal right to, to eat them up as a new resource, which unfortunately it really in a way happened historically with the unification. Um, so just a second, I need to, yes. So Schlingesiv then started German studies at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Later on, he applied uh, two times unsuccessfully at the Filmhochschule from Film und Fernsehen in München. This was also in the 80s. I think this was also very, uh, very formative. In just a second, I have this uh, mouse here. Yes. Uh, this unfortunate event could be uh, considered as one of the crucial departure point of his career and the basis for a new creative energy to make films, which under the umbrella of uh, High FF Munich wouldn't be possible. Lots of critics of uh, Schlinger Ziv consider this um, event as a very positive opportunity for him to make really free movies and really, really free artistic uh, statements. Uh, other notable rejection of the anecdote is from his teenage years at age 16. He presented his uh, Super 8 uh, film, Mommy, we are shooting a movie at the VDR. It's a German state TV. Uh, in the children's editorial office and after the movie was shown, uh, uh, the mood was like in the ice cellar and the editor stopped, stood up and said, I only know one thing when I see the film, you will never be able to love a human being in your life because you weren't interested in the people. These are the traces, I mean, this is the egomania which, which will be could be recognized also in his later artistic process, but he was never all sensitive. He was very open and never cynical toward other people and artists which he was collaborating. So this uh, type of um, formative experiences, traumas, remind him in his films and theater presentations. Schlingensi was very effective in turning these personal failures in um, chances for some new creativity in artistic process. Just a second, I need to move on. Yes. So I will try now to shape some of aesthetic uh, um, arguments about Schlingensi's uh, work. Um, you, you see here first the uh, a quote of uh, Schlingensi. Uh, it was at the end of his life. I got stuck in the ice at some point. I didn't get to the North Pole. I didn't reach the moon. I couldn't get my political views through. I didn't create mass movement. I didn't create art that would prevail. I didn't become who I wanted to be. Uh, from all this is very uh, also very crucial that his political views were very, I don't say confused, but they are very broad from the ultra-liberal to the left, kind of camaraderie, from the almost kind of um, Nazi joking, everything was possible. He did not limit it himself. 
Actually, I had the chance to meet him a few times in Munich, and also later on, uh, he remained in my email contact. And uh, when he organized his uh, political party, Chance 2000, I, I could participate in it. So, it, in a way, it's not true that he couldn't create a mass movement, but he could not create it successfully, that's for sure. Then we have the element of messianism, uh, which uh, could stem also from Yosem Boyce as a shamanistic prophet, who was a very big idol for Schlingensief. And at the Boyce, we have these anthroposophic and alchemist origins of Boyce philosophy and its influence on Schlingensief oeuvre, which was, as stated before, really huge. Uh, and then we have this quote of Boyce where he is saying, the only problems of the people are a false understanding of economics, the power of money, and the power of governments, of states. Turning the state off is the idea of art. Away with such states and political parties and politicians. We need to establish a new economic system, a new way of dealing with money, a new credit system that addresses the fundamental problems, then art would have the most important role, according to Boyce. And uh, the technique how Schlingensief was preparing his films or theater um, uh, works uh, could be regarded uh, also asynchronous and atonal. And this atonality is uh, uh, stemming from Arnold Schoenberg. And now I would like to read you a little quote from Adorno on this topic. Um, for Schlingers, if Schoenberg's music provided him with an important point of departure, and, and that his aim for the production was to develop a theory, theatrical counterpart to Schoenberg's work. On the stage, he writes, there is a second music, but that one can see, can see, but cannot be heard. In his essay on popular music, Adorno claims that this non-productive, non-participatory mode of having fun fostered by the entertainment industry is a correlate of alienated forms of mechanized labor that leave workers feeling exhausted, bored, and unfulfilled. unfulfilled. According to Adorno, because standardized forms of mass entertainment, such as popular music and television, do not require any real effort or concentration, they provide the worker with the relief from both boredom and effort simultaneously. The workers, he writes, seeks novelty, but the strain and boredom associated with actual work leads to avoidance of effort in that leisure time which offers the only chance for really new experience. In, in stark contrast to this alienated conception of what, what it means to have fun, the second definition touched on by Schlingensief is associated with an active, creative mode of engagement, a mode in which the capacity to draw and make one's own connection and association is absolutely central to the production and experience of pleasure. The emphasis here is not on the kind of canned pleasures that Adorno associates with the consumption of pre-mastered material, rather this mode, is, mode of experience is bound with the capacity to actively participate in life and to draw one's own imagination in the process of engaging creatively with the material in question. In Adorno's writings, a similarly active, creative mode of engagement is explored in his analysis of modernist art practices and in his essays on the work of Austrian composer Arnold Schoenberg, in particular, whose optimal compositions result in what Adorno describes as the re um, reunification of the customary crutches 
of a listening which always knows what to expect. This is a quote from a book of Tara Forrest, and she's a huge expert on, on also on Schlingensief and Alexander Kluge, who was also uh, writing uh, uh, lots of articles, and they have also interviews with Schlingensief. Uh, I mean, Alexander Kluge had many interviews with Schlingensief, and they had really vivid discussions on society and art. Uh, the other exhibition which we are, I will mention here is the Locus Control exhibition which happened in New York 2012 and I will just uh, read some uh, um, sujet of that. The show cites the social psychology of Ju Julian Rotter and his popular personality test, the Locus of Control. According to Rotter, people operate on continuum. Those with a high internal locus of control believe that events result primarily from their own behavior and actions. Those with a high external locus of control conversely believe that powerful others, fate or chance, primarily determine events. Acknowledging that art objects also make claims and take positions on how and why events unfold, sometimes contrary to the intentions of their makers. The locus of control re references Rotor scale to consider how artistic methodologies are like personalities, a visible aspect of a larger complex character. Schlinger's work is dependent on an ideal of social participation and exchange. Accordingly, he was actually attuned to the pressing issues of society. Many of his projects functioned in an activist mode, looking to initiate social energies. But the artist and the command structures at play in his work required an egomaniacal talent to control how and when he brought people together. So this emancipatory praxis in uh, Schlingensief's work is really crucial and all, all of his, um, even theater presentations, he was involving public into the space and everything. So this is uh, also the reenactment of personal life, like uh, what earlier mentioned, his childhood and everything was replayed again and again in the theater pieces on the film uh, he reenacted all the time his personal life and also the historical event, most notably the 20th century, like the Holocaust, Second World War, and uh, 1968 or this. And uh, according to this, uh, politics became art artistic in, in his view, and art is still art, but we have this uh, open question what, what art is and art's role today is. And um, I think our art is now struggling uh, to, to prove its uh, importance and role in society. Then again, uh, uh, Schlingensief was also representing some kind of idea of minimalism. That means like uh, also the Nazis would say like thousand year years Reich, like um, a new, new, new empire which would last like a, a, a millennial, yes. And, um, and then exactly at that time, in the year 2000, a bit earlier, he started this political move on Chance 2000. A very important kind of last um, uh, idea on this was uh, on Marx Capital, Tsim Capital, which is, um, which is an excellent book. Uh, of um, this is this book uh, where, where uh, Christoph Schlingensief had a conversation with Johannes Stuttgen. Uh, if you may maybe know, Johannes Stuttgen was the master shooter of Josef Beuys, like his right hand and assistant, and he's the only living person, according to my knowledge, today who is really. Uh, aware of this uh, social plastic and other traditions uh, defined by Joseph Beuys. 
Uh, in a short uh, phone conversation this week with Johannes Stuttgart, I was also asking him about what what were actually these political views of uh, Christoph Schlingens, and 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 we both need to um, um, to come to the conclusion that this, this was really a complex issue, and uh, it cannot be just um, stated he was uh, left or liberal or any of these categories. Uh, now I will just go through just very shortly just to see the, how huge is his, um, his um, over, like uh, the works. This is the, f the film, li list of films. As you can see, the first film where he's an actor, he's, an, he's nine years old. So he's very, very young age, already started to be creative and making movies and and uh, and representing this cutting montage and everything and um, he also liked to work lots of with the um, actor Udo Kier who also was acting in, in Hungary in certain avant-garde movies in the 80s and uh, in that sense it's very interesting how this line and connection to the post-socialist bloc was also very important for Schlingensief um, yes, the, the, then, then he had around 1988, 100 years of Adolf Hitler. It's, it's, it's of course, it's a mockery on Adolf Hitler, but still he, he, he was showing this kind of panic situation, which we could imagine what would be in the bunker in the last hours of Adolf Hitler. The other movie I already mentioned, the Deutsche Kettensägen Massacre, uh, Terror 2000 was also a very important project where he was um, also addressing the question of unemployment in a TV show. Then 1984, uh, uh, Todd Eines Weltstars. This is a film uh, for TV uh, with a with Hobbit uh, actor Udo Kier. I will just jump because there are many, plenty more. The theater pieces, this is really the list. It's not, it would not fit into 15 minutes. I will jump back maybe to some points of this. <clears throat> also very important um, for Schlinger Ziv was, he died in the year 2010, age uh, 49, and um, that in his, um, for example, in his hometown, a city was named after him, uh, just a second. And uh, I, I like this photo when, when they put this plate uh, because uh, I can see the workers. I mean, the local workers from his uh, hometown, Oberhausen. And may, maybe I'm projecting, uh, but, but the face is this kind of uh, seriosity, how, how they are doing this task of uh, removing the one, one uh, street name with, with Schlingensiefs uh, is giving me a hint of, of this respect and love which he could have in, even in his hometown. The most important project of Schlingensief, which was um, involved with the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs and government, was um, creating an opera village in Africa, in Burkina Faso. On the left side, you see the, 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 the Mecca, Maqueta. Uh, actually, the, the, the opera building itself was not yet built, but he created a village where, where there is a school for children and also a little hospital and um, all kind of social institutions. So basically, this is his masterpiece, I would say because all the social activism that he was promoting um, became um, real in, in his this uh, last project. Uh, he could not really finish it because he died from cancer. He wrote several books on the topic of cancer and how is he dying and all the suffering and trauma regarding this uh, very nasty disease. Uh, at, at the end, I also want to mention artistic practices which are similar to Schlingensief's work. 
very similar and important is Renzo Martens uh, Enjoy Poverty. It's a project uh, where Enzo Martens created uh, uh, in a village also in Africa uh, this uh, light uh, effect, yeah, this installation, and basically just explaining and convincing the, the inhabitants of this very poor area that there, there is no other alternative just to enjoy what they have. It means poverty. Of course, it, it, it sounds cynical. It was, it's not that simple at all because he also struggled how to wage the wages, how they can be changed and fair trade and all kind of uh, projects parallel to this. No? So it's not just like this, but this is one element of it. The other person who, uh, um, activist or artist I want to mention is um, Russell Brand. He lives in England and um, he even uh, calls this uh, one of his shows Messiah Complex. It's a comedy show which started 2013. And uh, of course, he, he is mixing up all kind of religions and um, creating of kind of pseudo uh, religious um, 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 sentiment in his show. And he's a very good actor and he can really uh, uh, excellently do this job. On the, on the right side, you see the other, um, it was the protest against the austerity measures in Britain. Uh, I think year 2012 or something like this. I, I'm not sure. Uh, he took, took a part and he was actively against this. So just to see. Uh, these are the literature links where you can find uh, some insights on Shlingenziv and um, other material. The last link is a film gallery. You can uh, watch lots of his movies in a full length, so it could be useful if someone likes it. And that, that would be my presentation, and thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Rita. Uh, up next, we, we have uh, two presenters, two speakers from Hungary. Uh, Virag Ilona Buka. Um, she's a master student uh, in art theory uh, at uh, Etos Laurent University in Budapest and a former me member and secretary of College for Advanced Studies in Social Theory. She's the editor of the social science journal uh, Turning Point and the co-author of uh, with uh, Christoph Negi of uh, an essay entitled Culture Should Be Common published in Ford Blood uh, in September uh, 2020. And uh, Christopher Nagy, also from, from Budapest, uh, uh, he's a PhD candidate at uh, the Department of so Sociology and Social Anthropology of the Central European University. His PhD project examines uh, the configurations of uh, state infrastructures of professional culture in uh, Hungary in the context of uh, state formation and uh, hegemony forging. Uh, he holds uh, a master in uh, sociology and another in the history of uh, art from the um, Cartold um, Institute uh, of uh, Art, and uh, he's affiliated uh, with the Art Pool Art Research Center in Budapest. He published uh, his work in Hungarian, English, German, and Spanish, such as the chapter uh, Rabinek Studio, the Codification of Art in Late Socialist Hungary, in the volume Contemporary Art and Capitalist Modernization. Uh, a trans-regional perspective uh, in Rutledge, 2020, and uh, his most recent exhibition project was the left turn, right turn, artistic and political radicalism under late socialism uh, at uh, the Blinken uh, uh, OSA uh, archive in uh, Budapest in the autumn 2008. Uh, do we have you okay, unmuted? Please, the floor is yours. Uh, quick question before starting. I share my screen. Do you see it? Yeah, we can Great. see it. Okay, so Virag, the floor is yours. 
Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity as well. And uh, hello everyone, and welcome to our presentation about the history of Cattolo Artist Colony. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me uh, well. Yes, we can hear uh, you. Okay, uh, so I'm going to make a small introduction about the historical context of the artist colony first, and I think we should start with the uh, um, how the alienated and the impersonal mass production and the expansion of capitalist mode of production inspired a lot of artistic and social movements of the 19th and 20th century. And uh, one of the first of them, the theorists and the artists of the arts and crafts movement, uh, made a huge influence on the Godolo artists uh, from the works of William Morris, John Ruskin and Leo Tolstoy. Uh, the artists of Godolo encounter the ideas of coexisting with nature and uh, uh, harmonious fusion of life and uh, basically a definition of art that can be achieved through mainly uh, craftsmanship. But while the British arts and crafts movement aimed to reach back to the pre-modern culture forms with their medieval orientation, the Godolo artists um, were turning towards peasant and folk culture, which is also not a unique phenomenon at the turn of the 20th century. And uh, with our presentation, uh, we examine the possible pitfalls of building an alternative artwork through the example of uh, the mentioned Godolo artist colony that operated in Hungary between uh, 1901 and 1921. And uh, it is useful to know that uh, Godolo is in the agglomeration of Budapest and uh, it was a popular tourist center at the time due to its uh, royal palace. Um, and while most of the literature on the Godolo artist colony tend to revolve around these before mentioned ideas, um, we aim to confront these ideas with their practical implementation. Um, and I think that uh, First, we should uh, investigate the reason behind this uh, mentioned consideration about reaching back folk culture, which was that folk and peasant culture allegedly contains the pure and forms of Hungarian national identity and the essence of the Hungarian people. Uh, besides, according to the Godel artists and the Hungarian cultural policy, peasant communities carry uh, some crucial virtues like uh, authenticity, realness, um, and harmony in relation to community and nature. Um, and last but not least, it was also quite essential for them that in their eyes, folk culture had not been touched by modernization and capitalism yet. Um, and it is necessary to highlight that the artist's expectations and views were only covered by a few arbitrarily selected segments of Hungarian folk and peasant culture, for example, some areas of Transylvania. Uh, and the application of folk culture played a serious part in building the bourgeois national culture, while in theory, artist and national culture policies protected both a na nation against modernization. Um, and the admiration towards folk and uh, peasant culture manifested in the Godelo artists a regular visit to the chosen village communities uh, where the teams of the peasants and the specially ornamented objects as well. So as you can see, there are a lot of questionable aspects about the Godelo artists approach. And first we would like to make an argument about the populist rhetoric and the practice they used. Uh, because by portraying particular segments of peasant and folk culture as something transcendental or uh, inherently pure, um, not only in an aesthetic, but also, also in an ethical way, um, they ignored those socio-economic and historical conditions uh, in, which, uh, in which these parts of folk culture were created. Uh, because by detaching the original context in which these culture products like uh, clothing and ornamentations were created, uh, Godelo artists used these uh, products to get inspiration and knowledge for their own uh, modern artworks from which they gained a lot of financial and uh, also cultural recognition on international and of course on national levels. Uh, we will 
to go to a member of the colony who said all culture has an aesthetic perspective, is uh, historical, and is based on an ornamental view. Uh, you can see it on the screen as well. Uh, where this sentence perfectly reflects, uh, reflects our critique, uh, even if in the original context, of course, it was meant to be something positive for them. Uh, and another member of the community described folk culture as a form of capital, which they need to use in order to maintain and reform modern art. Um, however, in reality, it came with getting financial and also symbolic acknowledgement and uh, contributed to the creation of um, of a Hungarian national culture along with the state's uh, culture policy. Uh, and while in theory Godolu artists and also their theoretical sources emphasized the division between professional artists and non-artists or, or unskilled ones, uh, in practice this, uh, this dichotomy remained uh, solid because, uh, because not only the original pieces of folk culture were excluded from the artwork, but uh, the producers of the Godelo carpets as well. <clears throat> uh, the people who were working on the Folkish carpets, uh, designed by mostly male artists, were mainly underpaid and fairly young girls. Uh, you can see a few carpets on the screen, I think. Yes. Uh, even though they were skilled in different kinds of techniques, uh, they could not get involved in any part of the creative designing since male artists uh, declared that uh, the weaving girls and women did not have the skills to become artists. And uh, connected to a few minutes, we would like to introduce the story of the Godolo Weaving Workshop, uh, which was uh, founded in 1904 with significant state support. And only a year later, the artists already participated in prestigious exhibitions with the carpets and other textiles from Godolu. Uh, the carpets were branded as homemade and naturally dyed yarn. And after a few years, almost 50 women were employed there. Um, However, the social situation of the um, uh, employed women, it has been repeatedly argued that the weaving workshop provides employment opportunities for the lowest social classes. But from other statements, it appears that in many cases, girls from more favorable social backgrounds participated in the work and also in the daily life of the colony. Although in most cases, the primary motivation was, uh, was still livelihood. Um, and I think that the weaving workshop story is important because uh, the Godolo artist colony was practically built on this weaving workshop and the work of the underpaid young girls, as the Godolo artists were able to take part in the most popular festivals and be an analysis of the age with the carpets made here. Uh, nonetheless, the workshop could not have survived on its own and received continuous significant state support. Uh, and uh, finally, considering the exploitation of the weavers, um, it may seem surprising that the community of the colony considered the, the emancipation of women to be a particularly important topic in theory, of course. However, the designers were mostly men, and uh, although sometimes the artists' wives also designed and did artistic work, uh, they still represented the security of the families in our life. Uh, as the leading male artist considered motherhood to be the most important of women's roles. Um, and I think this is the end of my part. So, Christoph, please uh, continue and yeah. thank you. Thank you. Uh, I can't take this after, after we got summarized that despite the fact that the little artist colony was referring to the peasantry, we didn't have any direct contact, uh, connection with this peasantry or if. The direct connection was based on exploitation, subordination. After this, I will focus on that, which were the social uh, forms in which the artist colony actually had a, a coalition, and it was primarily the Hungarian state of the early 20th century. Uh, and it is not a self evident uh, story that these radical artists quoting uh, William Morris and Tolstoy 
could uh, make a good couple with the more and more nationalist Hungarian state of the early uh, early early 20th century, especially because some of the, these leading artists of this good old artist colony were more or less flirting socialist ideas. You can have a look uh, on this uh, ex libris made by the, one of the leaders of the uh, artist colony for one of the most important early 20th century Hungarian Marxist thinkers for Erwin Sabo. There is these two uh, girls and one of them is uh, holding actually a sickle and the other is a book and so some agrarian Marxist vision you can see here. Uh, However, uh, the leading figures of the Gödel artist colony uh, quickly um, uh, made a friendship with the, one of the leaders of the contemporary culture of politics. Uh, he was named Alec Lippi, uh, who was the leader of the cultural policy regarding visual art. And this Alec Lippi came to re-establish and rethink uh, the visual representation of the nation, and he aimed to move uh, from these historical academic paintings of the 19th century towards something more modern, and he aimed to uh, re-establish the visual representation of the nation uh, based on the elements of folk culture. And actually, these artists of the Gödel uh, artist colony were perfect for this uh, objective because these artists were actually uh, applying this folk culture. I've already emphasized of any historical and social contextualization. Uh, however, uh, this, uh, uh, this marriage was not uh, self-evidently a good marriage because they had, different, of course, different ideas and different uh, objectives with the emphasis on peasant culture. From the perspective of the state and ministry, it was important to strengthen national identity and indirectly uh, to uh, foster national culture industries such as the weaving workshop could uh, be an example for this. But rather for, for the artist, or from the perspective of the artist, the importance of peasant culture and the reference to peasant culture was to somehow go beyond the alienated industry of production and to find some mode of production which is not uh, uh, not built on, on capitalist, capitalism. So by, for the first uh, look, these two objectives are contradictory. Somehow they, this could go together, especially because the position of the state was stronger because they owned the financial resources. And one of the these conflicts was uh, uh, between the colony and the artist arose actually uh, around the weaving workshop that Virag already um, analyzed because the artists were skeptical with uh, establishing an industrial uh, production of artworks, while the ministry was really emphasizing the importance of the industrial production of artworks. And at the end, as you could see, the uh, state position won and they established this uh, weaving workshop. And there was a really a mutual importance for, for the politics and for the artists. From the perspective of politics and the state, these artists were those who realized the idea or the theory of this new national art. So of course, there are theorists who are writing the theory of this new national art, but somehow someone should implement it, someone should put it into practice. And these artists of the Gödel uh, colony were perfect for this, uh, for this uh, project. And from the perspective of the artist, uh, for them, the state and politics became central because more or less this was their only income. So they uh, became completely dependent on, on the on state subsidies. One of the artists wrote in a letter for this uh, cultural politician who supported them that you are our Rushkin who protects us from attacks with your belief in us. <laughs> so I think this quotation somehow summarizes very nicely uh, this subordination of artists into politics. And how this uh, state support happened, or what were the forms of this state support. On the one hand, there were personal support directly uh, allocated to the artists. On the other hand, there were purchases by state museums, uh, for example, the purchase of rocks and uh, interior designs and so on. Uh, thirdly, there was the state subsidy of the weaving workshop that we already mentioned, 
and fourthly, there were also public commissions. And these public commissions were really large-scale public positions. They could design the Hungarian pavilion of, in the San Luis World Fair in uh, 1904, the Milan World Fair on 1906, the Hungarian pavilion for the Venice Biennial, which is still standing, uh, and they could product, produce rats for the Hungarian parliament and for the national uh, salon, which was practically the place where Hungarian visual arts were represented. So practically in these years, in this first decade of the early 20th century, the artists of the Godolio Artist Colony produced all the important national uh, representational projects, both uh, in the country and both abroad. Uh, and they, of course, they had uh, recurrent attempts to somehow reach the local middle class and its purchasing power, but without any real success. So they could be criticized for not, not reaching the peasantry, but they couldn't even reach the local middle classes. They were therefore uh, entirely dependent of, uh, on the state. And uh, the state dependency has a really mm, special consequence, exactly because the, the state resources and state funds are limited. Therefore, if since the general artists got all the state funds, other artists got much less or no state funds in this decade or decades. And actually in 1910, the previously dominant historical painters and the emerging Paris train post-impressionist post -impressionist Fauvist painters some of forged a coalition against this Godelle artist colony because they were so provoked by the fact that this relatively small group of artists uh, got all the, all the financial support. And uh, as I see, we are running out of time. So I just would like to um, finish with a couple of takeaways from uh, from our presentation. And I think the central takeaway is already in the title. So don't look at theory, look at practice. So of course, uh, literature is usually uh, analyzing what these uh, good artists wrote about their art, what they stated about their art, but they much uh, less usually uh, have a look in the, their actual practice, and they don't have a, really have a interest into the towards the contradictions of theory and practice. And we think that if we would like to make an, another artwork more just and more equivalent, we should really deeply focus on the practice. And the nice and fancy theories of equality are not enough. And uh, as you could see through this case study. Uh, the incorporation of alternative artistic practices are reopening happening and in our region in Eastern Europe this incorporation is primarily uh, um, who uh, happens from the side of the state and much less from the side of, of capitalism or directly from the art market. And so therefore in Central Eastern Europe even these radical art uh, culture producers because these good artists were in certain sense radical, are incorporated by state actors. Uh, so one of the takeaways, I think that uh, revolutionary ideas in, in themselves cannot uh, liberate, uh, since their ideas are not uh, interacting with the peasantry into which they are preferring. So if we could have two takeaways, the first would be that do not idealize any social class as the so uh, source of pure and untouched cultural practice because as you can see uh, this could lead to several misunderstandings of, of any artistic and political project and the other uh, or second takeaway is that uh, the ideological or artistic autonomy should be based on a material autonomy since this, the artists of the Godel artist colony didn't have any material autonomy they uh, um, therefore they became entirely dependent of this, on the state, and therefore their originally revolutionary project somehow um, became just the fuel of the more and more nationalist Hungarian state project of, of the early 20th century. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Christoph and uh, Vidak. Um, up next, we have uh, our last presenter for, for this uh, session. Eduardo Marcosei-Mehen, uh, who is a filmmaker and a researcher from Mexico City, recently relocated to the Italian Alps. His films have uh, screened 
at the festivals uh, uh, all over the world. In uh, Mexico City, he co-organized Cine Club, uh, a series of uh, screenings presenting uh, experimental and, and, and ethnographic uh, films in collaboration with the Institute Francais of uh, Latin uh, America. He curated uh, the uh, online uh, film program against uh, against the spectacle documentary uh, uh, for Casa del Lago and uh, is currently working with uh, the site uh, Korean, specialized in experimental Latin uh, American cinema to present uh, uh, the film Mirrors of Heart by uh, Chihana filmmaker. Uh, Lord uh, uh, Portillo in January to, uh, 2021. Uh, he's enrolled uh, in the critical studies uh, offered by the new center in collaboration with uh, Ecola Superior Artistica de Porto. Uh, he taught uh, documentary appreciation and uh, practice in the community school Faro Aragon, located in the periphery of Mexico City. The outcome of his research project, uh, 2P2 Infrastructure for uh, the Storage, Delivery and Public Exhibition of Educational Films, will be published in the Finnish States Journal by the end of 2020. He is part uh, of the team behind the Materia Alberta, a summer school focused on art, theory and technology. Eduardo, if you're ready, please start. Hello, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, we can hear you. Um, hello to everyone. Um, uh, can you see my presentation? Be okay, perfect. Uh, my name is Lorena Kosaimagen, and today I will be speaking about the film The Pillar of Autonomy. This film was produced by the Zapatista Media Collective Los Tercios Compas. The Zapatistas are a multi ethnic group composed of Tolchil, Celtal, Rosolabal, and Shol people who declared war against the Mexican government and army in January 1, 1994. After 500 years of slavery and oppression, to rebel against neoliberalism in several towns of Mexican southern state Chiapas. After 12 days in conflict, the Mexican government declared a ceasefire and invited the Zapatistas into negotiations. But after almost 30 years, there is still no resolution. Mexican government continues to engage with the market and free trade economy agreement, and the Zapatistas continue to deny any governmental aid while they are continuously harassed and attacked by paramilitary groups, which are suspected to be aided, to be aided by the government. Before continuing, I would like to mention that I am making use of still images coming from the film by following the terms established by its authors. Reproduction without population purposes, circulation in the opposite direction, and non-consumer consumption are authorized. As you can see, their logo is a cat dog putting the watermark where it should, that is, below and to the left. After the Zapatista uprising, several national and international reporters and documentarians arrived at their territory aiming to tell the story of Zapatistas from an external point of view. Along this way, Alexandra Halkin, founder of the Chiapas Media Project, arrived in Zapatista territory for the first time in 1995 while producing a documentary for an NGO from the United States. While the external journalists were getting their stories, several people in the community came up to me to ask about my Hi8 camera, where I bought it, how much it cost, etc. Clearly demonstrating an interest in an awareness of this technology and an obvious desire to communicate their message to the outside world. This type of experience made Halkin aware that the Zapatistas could benefit from the technical knowledge of video production and started to discuss the possibilities of conducting video workshops within the Zapatista community. Between 1998 and 2012, Chiapas Media Project trained more than 200 people in basic video production and built and equipped five regional media centers for the production and post-production of digital video and audio. Chiapas Media Project was an initiative of an international and heterogeneous group of people 
such as Alexandra Halkin, Guillermo Monteforte, Tom Hansen, Jose Manuel Pintado, Fabio Mentis, and Paco Vázquez, who built alliances between them and several other agents. The first workshops within Zapatista communities began in February 1998. This date is described in what was called the most violent period between the Zapatistas and the Mexican government from January to June 1998. The first workshop happened two months after a paramilitary group massacred 19 women, 14 girls, four boys, eight men, and four born in Axial Chiapas. For the Zapatistas, taking video and other media in their hands was not for entertainment nor artistic self expression. They learned how to make films as a weapon to physically and epistemically defend themselves, creating audiovisual linguistics that are radically distant from the narrativization technique that most urbanized and westernized filmmakers employ when approaching non-westernized. In the Zapatistas have created films for both external and internal audiences. Although there is not enough documentation about the internal use of video, the text, Video as a Tool for Change, Gender Dispersing Zapatista Indigenous Communities from 2008, written by Claudia Magallanes Blanco, explains how the Zapatista film, We Are Equal, helped open the conversation about gender equality within the Zapatista community. Magallanes Blanco describes how after filming more than 30 hours of interviews and observational footage, it was agreed by consensus among all members of the community that it was important to have screenings of the raw material and discuss these issues in public. Zapatista videos are designed as audiovisual didactic tools for sharing information concerning their modes of living in rebellion. As Erika Kusi Wortham wrote in her book, Revolutionary Indigenous Media, they capture how Zapatista civilian communities apply basic revolutionary principles that resist market logic, such as an inalienable relationship to land, to actively protect their autonomy and build their futures. After the Chiapas Media Project completed their work in the formation of videographers, there was an internal necessity within the communities to unite all the Zapatista communication teams in a single body that manages all the media for both internal and external communication. In 2014, the communication teams merged and formed Los Tercios Compass, a body whose members come from all the Zapatista regions. This was an answer to the accumulated discomfort of the Zapatistas with the inability of the national and international media to conduct and present analytical research journalism in the town of cybernetic information. As their spokesperson, the subcomandante Galeano, said during a press conference in 2014, the paid media has presented something that is marvelous within capitalism, because it is one of the few times in which capitalism has turned non-production into a commodity. Supposedly, the job of the media was to produce information circulated in a way that it is consumed for their different publics or receptors, and capitalism has achieved for the media to earn without producing, that is to say, for not informing. From then on, Los Tercios Compass became the sole out for output for covering events and sharing them through the internet. Los Tercios Compass defined themselves as a collective dispersing calendar and geography, and they would be completely anonymous if not because their members are betrayed by their irreverent rebellion. They are the mass media of the Zapatistas and function every time they can, which is not very often. It is formed by human and animal beings, though sometimes they are not differentiated from one another. In 2014, Xochitl Leiva Solano wrote, Zapatista video is part of an alternative rebel organizing process. It challenges the tyranny of writing by reivindicating the orality of communitarian communication. It challenges the monopoly of imperial languages, English and Spanish, by being recorded in the language of their Mayan authors. The importance of producing videos in their own languages needs to be understood in terms of the epistemological racism that is so common within Mexico and the Americas, where the mestizos and European descendants are often blinded to the structural racism imposed upon the heterogeneous ethnical groups who are commonly referred to with the umbrella concept indigenous. Several people who are referred to as indigenous grow without knowing so. As an example, the mixed linguist Yasnaya Aguilar mentions in a 27th article, the consciousness of being indigenous was born within her as she arrived in the city. To defend themselves from epistemic warfare and ethnocidal attacks, the notion of video machete appears as a necessary double-edged sword. This conceptualization of video was shared to Paco, Paco Vasquez of the Chiapas Media Project by a Zapatista filmmaker. Video is a new machete. It can be used as a weapon to defend oneself or as a tool to build and create. 
the machetes and their variations are a common tool used in agricultural practices all around the world. As a tool in the hands of people living in rural areas, it has also been used as a weapon of self-defense against structural oppression on several occasions in countries such as Puerto Rico, Mexico, Philippines, and South Africa. In its regular agricultural use, it aids in food production and situates its human user in the life cycle of the territory. Machete users possess a privileged proximity to the soil itself, the concrete, direct realm of the agriculture. Therefore, El Pilar de la Autonomía is a video machete that works in both directions. Within Zapatista communities, the creation of video machetes aids self-determination towards the achievement of a structural change, as happened with the case of We Are Equal. Towards external audiences, Zapatista video machetes can cause a structural wound in the capitalist realist episteme of a Westerner observer, while offering information in a didactic form that contains the capacity of healing the damaged ontological and epistemological formations of the Western self by telling and showing the possibility of organized communal life outside of the free market economy, such is the case of El Pilar de la Autonomía. One of the particularities of El Pilar de la Autonomía is that throughout its 30-minute duration, the voices of several Zapatistas complete each other's ideas, making it impossible to discern if the verbal discourse is constituted as a multi-agent interview or if it was previously written and collectively narrated. It is especially relevant for us to notice how their communal mode of socio-political organization is reflected through every aspect of the film. Even though there is no cookie cutter Zapatista structure, it is known that the community assembly is the most important first level decision making organism. And each community elects the representatives to participate in the general command. As the Mayan Guatemalan theorist Ladis Tulsul have said, I understand the systems of communal indigenous government, the plural plots of humans creating historical social relations that have a body, force, and content in a concrete space communal territories that produce government structures to share, defend, and recuperate the material medium for the reproduction of human and animal life. In El Pilar de la Autonomía, the Zapatista filmmakers share with us their cosmotechnical approach to eco-social communal life. But the ideas expressed by the individual subjects appearing in front of the camera are not constrained to an individual mode of experience. Instead, what they express is a communal experience to individual subjects. This ontological variation seems to be an elementary it seems to be elementary for communal life. Arturo Escobar describes it as follows: relational form of being, knowing and doing, defined as, as those social natural configurations in which nothing pre-exists, the relations that constitute it. Instead, everything is deeply constituted in relation to everything else. Therefore, we can understand this film as the container of an intersubjective experience, which irradiates from the communal and concrete real that is entangled with the ecological, psychological, and social landscape of the Zapatistas. In her 2002 book, Zapata Lives, Lynn Stephen writes, since many Zapatistas have come to the region within the past 40 to 60 years, their shared culture and identity is built out of their political experience and participation. In El Pilar de la Autonomía, Zapatistas generously share with us where they are in terms of their social, political, agroecological, and medical models of relational organization. They also mentioned that they are trying to recover pre-Columbian knowledge and interview their neighbors to continue to receive precarious aid from the government. The Zapatista model of cultural creation exceeds the westernized allocation of the concept culture because the culture of indigenous communities such as the Zapatistas is never mosaified nor sterilized to the market economy and its accessibility is not dependent on economic or educational affordability. Zapatista's cultural production is relationally engineered, sociopolitically implicated, and intersubjectively concrete because the cultural objects which integrate it are of public importance. For urbanized filmmakers and other cultural practitioners who are enmeshed within and informed by the capitalist realism episteme, it's useful to pay attention to Los Tercios Compas because they are sharing with us something that can aid us to overcome this stage of brutal globalization. Thanks a lot for listening.
Thank you, Eduardo. Uh, we still have uh, approximately ten, 10 minutes for Q&A uh, for a short discussion. And uh, I would like to read uh, a question for, from Jola to Vida. Uh, what uh, kind of general uh, militarization do you mean during the Kingdom of Yugoslavia? Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, should I respond immediately? Okay. Uh, well, I meant, uh, you know, the rise of, uh, of uh, state uh, apparatus that used all they, uh, their means, uh, such as uh, military, police, etc., to repress all social antagonisms that were going on in the interwar period, especially during the 30s. Uh, and uh, uh, the, in the period uh, uh, in late 30s uh, where uh, the processes of uh, fascization of society were going on, where the rise of right-wing right uh, political forces uh, were going on as well. So uh, any, uh, anybody, any individual uh, organization initiatives that was connected to uh, illegal communist party was uh, repressed. Uh, they were accused, arrested, uh, jailed, uh, uh, tortured, even uh, uh, killed in the political uh, prisoners uh, before the Second World War started. Uh, also, for example, many <clears throat> Um, uh, workers strike were going on during the 30s, uh, trade, uh, members of trade unions were also arrested uh, and accused, uh, military and police uh, forces were used to repress such strikes uh, that were going on. So I, I hope that I was clear enough. Thank you, Vida. Uh, do we have more questions from, from the audience? If you, uh, uh, there is a question for, for Martin. Um, Christoph asks, uh, could you elaborate uh, the concrete uh, creative practices used uh, in the workers' hostel experiment? Yeah, I tried briefly. So, like one of the one of the practices was what I mentioned is like making photos about the environment. So like basically like uh, which was typical also in, I don't know, in 68 uh, in these uh, like work, different worker uh, uh, type groups, I mean, worker groups were engaged, were engaged in culture production. So like basically depicting their everyday life and then processing what that means. And the other one was like uh, more about writing uh, and processing those writings in a group. So, and so what they basically did in, uh, in their everyday work and uh, what conflicts they write them down and process those and enact them out. That was it. Thank you. Yeah. I also have a question for Eduardo, if we still have time. Yes, 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 we can. Go on, please. For a really inspiring presentation and for showing these like we are all for two days in the conference related to another art world and we are talking about the same art world basically within the same limits and so on and so it was really inspiring hearing how i know film is used to to tackle this kind of epistemic injustice and and really the to trigger thinking about other ways of of relating in the world um, I'm wondering, do you um, have any knowledge or could you give us some more perspectives on uh, what is the place of artistic practices or however they are called within Zapatista communities? Because you were referring more to movie productions as a way, as a communication tool, basically, both internally and externally. But what is the place of arts? 
Yeah, sure. Um, so my, my hypothesis, and it's also something that I perceived when I was in Zapatista territory, is that all cultural practice is integrated within uh, political discourse. So, for example, you have Zapatista painting, which depicts, I don't know, like, like presence from the world or like or like the leaders of the UN as, as like part of the capitalist hydra. So what I'm trying to say is like all the Zapatista imaginary is uh, enmeshed within their uh, autonomous political practice. So there's not, not an actual separation. Um, uh, film is the easiest way is he is he is part of it for me to to tackle my research because I'm also a filmmaker and a film researcher, so it was easy for me to to, to explain that. But they also have like like music and and they also I don't know about other kind of performance practices such as theater or something like that. But they they organize encounters to 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 speak about women rights or 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 they. They play music, like have bands and stuff, and and then again the lyrics of the music refer to the same autonomous uh, political uh, practice. So, so it's really interesting for for me because it's like on like on like Western society that separates like art or like whatever. Like Zapatista uh, communities always reintegrated to their own like development of political autonomy practice. Yeah, that, thanks a lot. This is actually what like we were doing a field research in Colombia for two months uh, last year. And it's very similar to what FARC communities um, have been like, the way they have been integrating the creative practices or however you, you call it into the everyday work also the radio broadcasting and the filmmaking and other issues, which is really kind of shaking this Western notion that art is kind of separated or even autonomous as we like often to dream. Yeah, thanks for bringing this perspective. May I have just a quick follow-up question? So am I right, so am I understanding it correctly that there is no such thing as autonomous artists or professional artists in these artist communities, right? So art as a profession or as a separate profession, that's a decade for. for. For example, what happened with video was that uh, communities, assembly communities decided which participants of, of well, not, not which member of the Zapatista communities should uh, go and take the video, uh, the video workshop. But, but this does, doesn't mean they, they do not continue doing their other responsibilities, right? So it, it seems so like that, like if they are, they have the interest to do something like this, they, they do it and, and Los Tercios Compas uh, manage the whole uh, page in La Zapatista. I don't know if you know that page. And they transcribe the conferences, they, they upload the videos, so it's it's like it's like job it's like a labor, you know it's like it's not separated in, and it's not uh, differentiated from from working in agroecology or working in medicine. It, it's all it is all seen as as part of the same process, which is building their their autonomy. Thank you for this expansion. Do we have more questions? If not, I, I would like to thank you all for very insightful uh, presentations uh, today in this session. Uh, and we will have a 45 minutes uh, break for lunch and then uh, uh, we will continue with uh, the next uh, session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.